to walk us through the, the different steps as we're learning about the Jesus style. I also want to thank you guys for your participation. Um, we're glad for the, all of you who have made comments and provided your input. Um, tonight, I'm really going to try to keep things simple, but hopefully it's going to help drive home the, the basic thrust, the main point of the Jesus style. The first thing I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to read to you a quote that is related to what we have covered so far, and then we're going to spend the rest of our time discussing life application. At various points, I may reach out to, uh, to you guys for some comments, for some input, but uh, life application is really the main goal that I have for this evening. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together and let's get into this. All righty? Let me fix my mic here real quick. <clears throat> All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to give you praise tonight for your mercy. We want to give you thanksgiving for your mercy. Lord, we're gra very grateful that you are so merciful and so kind and so loving and gentle to us, Lord. <clears throat> the psalmist says, your gentleness has made me great. And indeed, Lord, your mercy and your kindness have brought every single one of us to, the, to this place in our lives, to this building, to this place in our lives, in our hearts. Lord, you've poured out your mercy upon us. And Lord, you're helping us to become the people that you've called us to be. You've empowered us. You literally have given us everything that we need to live our lives, not just to make it on, on planet Earth and not just to do things like pay bills and all that, but Lord, you've given us the ability to, to be Christ-like. So tonight, Lord, I pray as we wrap up this series on Jesus style, I pray, Father, that you would speak to our hearts and I pray that the words of scripture tonight would have a transforming effect on our lives. As you bring this session to a close, Lord, I just want to ask that you would please make whatever necessary changes there are, there needs to be in our hearts, God. God, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit abiding within us and empowering us, empowering us each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, during our last session, <clears throat> when I was listening to, uh, to Pastor Byron, I was reminded about a book that I read many years ago called The School of Christ written by a man named T. Austin Sparks. That's his name. Great book. He was alive uh, from the late 1800s to the, about 1971. And uh, I read through the book numerous times. And a lot of the material was very similar to what we've covered in the Jesus style. And there's one section in the School of Christ called the otherness of Christ. I'd like to read to you uh, an excerpt from that part of the book, The Otherness of Christ. I think it ties in very well with what we've been talking about. Talking about how the disciples of Jesus, as they were in the school of Christ, found how altogether different Jesus was from them. This was this was something that they had to learn. And here's what uh, T. Austin Sparks said about this. I do not think that it came to them at the first moment. It was as they went on that they found themselves again and again clashing with the thoughts of Jesus, clashing with his mind and his ways. They would urge him to take a certain course, to do certain things, to go to certain places, 
they would seek to bring to bear upon him their own judgments and their own feelings and their own ideas. But he would have none of it. At the marriage feast in Canaan of Galilee, his own mother with an idea said, they have no wine. His reply was, woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. Thus, throughout their lives, they sought to impinge upon him with their mentality. All the time, he was putting them back and showing them how different were his thoughts, his ways, his ideas, his judgments, altogether different. In the end, I expect they despaired. He might well have despaired of them had he not known that this was exactly what he was doing in them. Catch that and you've got something helpful. Lord, why is it that I am always caught out, always making a blunder? Somehow or other, I always say and do the wrong thing. I'm always on the wrong side. Somehow I never seem to come right in line with you. And I despair of ever being right. And the Lord says, I am teaching you. That is all. Deliberately, quite deliberately, that is exactly what I'm bringing you to see. This ordinary mind of man is at best, at its best, is another mind. This will of man at best is another will. You never do know what lies behind your motives until the Holy Ghost cleaves right down to the depths of your being and shows you. You may put your feelings and desires into the most devout terms. You may, like Peter, react to a divine suggestion. If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me, Jesus said. Peter responded with, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. But it is only self coming up again, a blessing for me. I want the blessing. And so miss the whole point the master is trying to teach. Remember when Peter did that? When Jesus tried to wash his feet? This self comes up in the most spiritual way. Self comes up for spiritual blessing. We do not know what lies behind. We have to come into a very severe school of the spirit which eventuates and are coming to discover that our best intentions are defiled. Our purest motives are unclean before his eyes. Things that we intended to be for God somewhere at their spring is self. We cannot produce from this nature anything acceptable to God. All that can ever come to God is in Christ alone, not in us. It will never, excuse me, it never will in this life be in us as ours. It will always be the difference between Christ and ourselves. Though he be resident within us, he and he only is the object of the divine good pleasure and satisfaction. And the one basic lesson you and I have to learn in this life under the Holy Spirit's tuition and revelation and discipline is that he is other than we are. And that otherness is indeed an utter thing. This is one of the hard lessons. So in other words, everything that there is that's good in us is everything that he's created. Think about it. Even our very existence, we are created in the image of God, right? But the reason God, that said, when God got done creating everything, the reason he said it is all good is because he made it. It's good because he said it's good. God defines what good is. So everything that's good comes from God. So everything that we can do that's good is because God has given us the ability to do it. And we're always learning how different he is than we are. It's a constant, lifelong lesson. Now, I think what I just read to you is a great way to summarize a large portion of what we've learned from the Jesus style. Having said all of that, I do not want to leave any of you with the impression 
that conformity to the Jesus style is only for the spiritually elite or only with those who have special abilities or gifts or that it's achieved by entering into some altered state of consciousness or going into some kind of a trance every time we want to engage in the Jesus style because this simply is not the case. And what I want to do in our time remaining this evening is sort of demystify what it means to be conformed to the image of Jesus, to embrace the Jesus style. Because everything that we're learning in this book is very down to earth and very practical. That's really, uh, that's really Gail's style of writing anyway. But the information contained in the book it's a very practical thing. In fact, on page 163 in the book, Gail, Gail says, lest you end this book feeling a load of guilt and hopelessness about whether you will ever attain to the maturity and fullness of our Lord, I wish to share an encouraging word from Scripture. And then this is what Pastor Byron quoted last week. Of course, Philippians 2.13. It's God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's number one. Number two, Ephesians 2.10, which we also read last week. For we are his workmanship, God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So that's a very important thing for us to discover, for us to realize, is that this is, the work that God has initiated in us by saving us to begin with. It's all going to be the Spirit's work within us. Walking as our Lord walked and living out the Jesus style is within the grasp of every Christian. Now, some of us may embrace it more readily than others. No doubt about that. But for those who do not, the reason for that will simply be that they have chosen not to. There's a decision that each one of us has to make day by day, sometimes hour by hour, minute by minute, to be Christ-like or to serve our flesh. A non-believer doesn't have this choice. And I'll explain that in just a moment. In fact, let's look at it right now. Go with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 6. I think that we all would do well. I haven't done this all the way yet, but I think we would all do well to actually memorize Romans 6, the whole chapter. Romans 6 is a chapter of absolute liberation of freedom. It's a chapter of freedom. I think if we ever needed, I know some people like, you know, they picture, they've got a picture of Romans 6 and then we go into Romans 7 and Romans 7 is about wrestling and struggle and then finally we get to Romans 8 and Romans 8 is like the victory chant after reading Romans 7. I don't agree with that. I think Romans 8 is a victory chant, don't get me wrong. But I think Romans 6 provides us with enough material to firmly plant our feet on solid ground as to where the Christian stands and positionally with what God has done in our lives. And I think Romans 6 has everything that we need to inform our consciences, to inform our hearts, our minds, <clears throat> with everything that we need to walk victoriously in the spirit. I think it's, Romans 6 is just an awesome chapter. It really is a comprehensive chapter. Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> We're going to jump into the middle of something here. I want to, I really want the word of God to encourage us in this matter of walking out the Jesus style. Look at Romans 6 verse 8. 
Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall live also with him. Now, this looks back to the beginning part of the chapter where it's talking about how the believer's life is identified with both a crucified Savior and the fact that he died and was buried in the tomb, in the tomb, tomb, in the tomb, and then raised to new life. The believer is identified with Christ in his resurrection as well. We live a resurrected life. So verse eight, if we have died with Christ, we also believe we shall live with him knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives unto God. Jesus didn't die twice. It's one of the reasons why the Roman Catholic Mass is, a, is blasphemy. Because the Mass is an, what they consider to be a non-bloody sacrifice of Jesus basically being re-crucified again over and over every time a Mass is performed. Jesus died once for all. Now what he does, seated in authority at the right hand of God the Father, is he ever liveth, as the King James says. He's always alive, making intercession for us. And so the model here is, but the life that he lives, verse 10 again, he lives to God. And so verse 11 continues, even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin. That means we die once, right? But alive unto God, in Christ Jesus. So we die once and then the ongoing life is, a, is a, a living thing. We're always alive in Christ. We're always looking at sin and saying to ourselves, I'm alive to Christ. That's dead to me. Verse 12. Therefore, continuation of thought, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, which if you're in Christ, you are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Doesn't that kind of sound like the Romans 12, 1 and 2 thing right there? Right? <clears throat> Conformity, don't be conformed to this world. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Doesn't that language sound just like this in verse 13? Now, it says what it says in verse 12. You've got a lot of imperatives there. Do not let sin. Do not go on presenting but present yourself. A lot of imperatives. Do this, do this, do this. But verse 14 provides the basis for that. For, there's your connecting word, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his son to die on the cross. And now that we are under grace, Sin has no master over you, no mastery over you. You can overcome sin because you are under grace. The capacity to be obedient to the Lord is already there residing within you if you're a Christian. Question is asked in verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? King James is better with this. God forbid. God forbid. May it never be. He continues with that thought. Verse 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? That makes sense, right? Either of sin resulting in death 
or of obedience resulting in righteousness. No, we're not under the law, but does that mean we live lawless lives? The answer is no. Cannot be that, because we've been freed from the law of sin and death. So it cannot be that now we get to turn around and say, oh, well, we're not under the law. That means we don't have to worry about subjecting ourselves to things like don't do this and don't do that. No, the fact of the matter is there is now a new enablement, an empowerment that's been given to us where the law is no longer a threat to us. When the Bible says thou shalt not murder, we don't, that doesn't bring condemnation to us. We say, well, of course not. I'm, I'm walking. I'm in the spirit now. I'm alive to God. Why would I want to murder? Why would I want to lie? <clears throat> uh, you were slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. He asked the question. But then verse 17, look at that. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. In other words, the gospel came to you. The gospel came, you heard the gospel, you heard the good news of Jesus, and you submitted yourselves to that. You said, I, that's what I want. I want to be born, I want to be saved. So you submitted to that form of teaching to which you were committed. Verse 18, and having been freed from sin, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Having been made free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. There's no problem with that kind of slavery. Does anybody have a problem being a slave? I don't. I, I'm a slave to Jesus. I have no problem being under his lordship and him telling me what to do. We don't like that in our culture anymore, right? We want to be able to do what we want to do. Now, he says in verse 19, I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, it just kind of keeps going downhill. You know, when the door of lawlessness is opened and we walk through it and we yield ourselves and yield ourselves, pretty soon we start sliding down, right? So now present your members as slaves to righteousness resulting in sanctification. <clears throat> now this is interesting. Look at verse 20. For, connecting word there, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Now this is a very interesting verse there. For when you were slaves of sin, in other words, he's talking about your former state, your unregenerate state. You were not at all under the influence of righteousness, you were entirely devoted to sin. What this is saying is then, is when you were in that condition, you had no native goodness. This is very, very important. It was not within our grasp when we were not believers because it was contrary to our essential nature. That's one of the reasons why we have to be very careful when we throw around the phrase free will. We have to qualify what we mean by that because man's will when they are not a believer, man's will is enslaved to the nature that controls him. He, he's, he's not free in the truest sense of that word. A non-believer is not free to obey God. A person who receives Christ, who can receive Christ, they can only receive Christ because God has enabled them to make that choice. 
Jesus said, no man can even come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. All of that comes from God. So we have to be very careful about that, that term free will. You guys have heard me talk about that quite a bit. But I bring this up just to simply point out that as non-believers, we didn't, we didn't have that freedom that we now have as Christians to obey God. Now we do. Now the freedom is ours. The ability is there. Verse 21, read the rest of it here. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things which are, you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been made freed from sin. I remember when we, we were going through Romans, <clears throat> I, I had a whole 10 paragraphs on just that phrase, having been made free from sin. And enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. Now we do have the, the freedom to obey. The ability is given. The desire, even the desire is something that God gave as we saw in Philippians 2.13. It's God who works in you both to will and to do. God does, does all of that for us. And then, of course, the last verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And there is a life there that not only means, yay, heaven, woohoo, going to heaven, but there's a life that's there also where God liberates us from the power, from the domain of sin. This is a wonderful thing that God has given to us. And the Jesus style, Christ likeness, is something that God wants us to achieve. Every one of us. Again, it's not for the elite. It's not for those, you know, really serious Christians. <clears throat> I, I know that there are Christians that are more serious than others. I get that. But God wants every single person that he has redeemed to experience Christ's likeness. <clears throat> and why wouldn't he want that? It's so liberating. <laughs> it's so liberating to be a slave of Jesus doesn't that sound weird? It's so liberating to be a slave. It really is. Because we have the freedom to walk away from sin, to turn away from temptation. We have that freedom that's been given to us from the Lord. And <clears throat> one of the things that gives us the ability to maintain that freedom in our walks is when we have an understanding of things. See, before we can achieve this, before we can achieve the objective of that book, we have to have an understanding. And the Jesus style is all over the Bible. Now what I want to do now is I want to just take a look at some scripture verses for the rest of our time. So, Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> and let's take a look at some things. Ephesians chapter 4. So the Spirit's work... <clears throat> is to bring transformation to our hearts, transformation to our minds, <clears throat> and throughout our lives, we are constantly being brought to the place of decision-making, right? We're always being faced with decisions as Christians. Now look at chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 1. <clears throat> Here's what it says. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called with 
Now here you go. Here's some, some examples of Christ-likeness. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. How about that? Or jump down to verse 17. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. He's referring to non-believers here. In the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. So see, that was, that's pre-believing, pre-Jesus, right? That's the state of their mind. That's the state of the mind of non-believers. But you haven't learned things that way, Paul said. You've, you've been brought into, into a whole new perspective, a whole new realm. Verse 20, you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you've heard him and have been taught in him just as <clears throat> trust is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, now he starts telling them how to put off one thing and put on another thing. You lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with, with the lusts of deceit. Remember that old way? Remember how you used to respond to things? Remember how when somebody did something <clears throat> that got on your nerves, you used to respond with some sort of negativity, some sort of sinful response. You got mad. Or you cussed at them. Or when you found yourself, your back was against the wall, someone, you know, if you, uh, uh, you, you felt intimidated, and someone said, blah, blah, blah. They asked you a question, and instead of answering them truthfully, truthfully you just lied. Because you kind of felt pinned up against the wall. You felt like, I need to lie right now, because if I tell them the truth, they're going to think a certain way about me that I don't want them to think. And so you lied. Or when that member of the opposite sex walked by, you know, you looked at him with lust in your heart. All these different responses that we had before we knew the Lord. Now we're told to put off all of that and we're told there, lay aside the old self that's corrupted. And then verse 23, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now that's, that's really powerful right there. That phrase there, be renewed, this is the only time this phrase is used in the New Testament. And according to one source, it actually comes from one single Greek word, and it's in what we call in, in, in the Greek, it's a verb in the passive voice, which, and I'm quoting here, is asserting obligations. The word has an imperative sense and yet it's in the passive voice. So the idea here is that the believer, when it says be renewed, the believer is being told, you need to put yourself in the position of being renewed. In other words, the renewal here is, it's not a self-renewal, it's something that is accomplished on or in the believers rather than by the believer. So in other words, you put yourself in this position and this is what's going to happen to you when you do. Does that make sense? Okay. So here he's saying, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Because what God is constantly wanting to do with us is he's wanting us to 
reorient the way we think about things, how we're going to respond to something, how we're going to respond to our spouses, to our friends, to our coworkers, how we're going to respond to choices in life. And the Lord wants the mind to be renewed. Then it goes on to say after that, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So you can see there that we're putting off in order to put on. And it's a constant renewal process. And God is the one that does the renewing. The Spirit's power comes upon us and, and gives us the ability to accomplish this. So regardless of whatever old vices there are, old, weird, sometimes, you know, personality quirks that are sinful quirks. You know, some people say, you know, I'm just, I just have a predisposition to being the kind of person that worries all the time. Well, worrying is a sin. That may be your predisposition. You may be wired in that way, but the Lord wants to undo that. It's not enough to say, I'm good. it's just the proneness, the proneness that I have to be a constant worry wart. Well, God wants to change that. You know, it's just, I've always been the type of person that just loses my temper real quickly. Well, the Lord wants to change that. I've always been a person who's been prone to depression. Well, God, that's a sin. God wants to, God wants to change that. He wants to reorient our way of thinking. He wants to turn our way of thinking upside down so that it conforms with the Holy Spirit. And it's a lifelong thing. That's why going back to what I quote, the quote I read to you from T. Austin Sparks, the otherness of Jesus, that's what was always tripping the disciples up. It wasn't like the Lord was just always wanting to frustrate them. We could do that with our kids, right? We could say, sit down. Hey, I told you to stand up. Huh? What? I told you to sit down. I told you to stand up. I mean, we could, we could just arbitrarily pick on them because they have to listen to us and we have the power to do it. We, you know, we could push them around if we wanted to. But see, that's not what Jesus was doing with the disciples. The reason they were constantly bumping into them is because they were constantly operating in the realm of the flesh. That's why they were bumping into them all the time. And Jesus being perfect, all the time, always on his game, if you will. <clears throat> That's why there was that conflict. Jesus wasn't picking on them. He was trying to show them we don't think on the same realm all the time. Now, they had their spiritual moments, but they also had their moment. And think about this. Sometimes they, they, they were even thinking of applying the scripture, a scripture one way, and Jesus was saying, that's not the way that's applied. Remember when Jesus was, was rejected in that town? Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven like Elijah did? I mean, look, Elijah did that. Jesus is like, what? You don't know what manner of spirit you're of. He rebuked them for that complete misappropriation of an Old Testament passage. That's not, that's not what that was about. It wasn't about you guys vindicating me or yourselves by calling fire down. That was an act of God. That was God challenging something, and this isn't the context for that. So there's a complete reorientation that God wants to take us through. Look real quick while you're in Ephesians. Go to, go to the right to Colossians 3. We're going to get to this eventually on Sunday. But this speaks to this. Verse 10 talks about the putting on of the new self based upon the new life that was given to us according to the image of the one who created him. Verse 12, look at verse 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on, see that there? Put on, put on a heart of compassion. Was Jesus compassionate? 
Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Imagine that. Imagine if you had just been stripped of your clothing, mocked, ridiculed, spit on, nailed to a cross by people who were guilty and the words of Jesus uttered are from the cross is, uh, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Compassion. The next one there is humility, or excuse me, kindness. Jesus was kind. The woman with the issue of blood. The woman with the issue of blood knew she was ostracized from the rest of the community because she had a blood issue. She couldn't even be mingled amongst the crowds. She had spent all her money on physicians. There was no cure. She said to herself, if I just touched the hem of that guy's garment, she knew she would be made whole. She does. She's healed. Jesus calls her out. Who touched me? Someone's touched me with virtue. Jesus calls her out. Because Jesus wanted a, a public testimony and humility. And the woman came, told her all her heart, that was me, I did it. And, and she was healed. Kindness, willing to touch someone, a leper, heal a leper. Kindness, uh, humility. We've talked about that a lot, humility. Gentleness. That's one I struggle with. I'm not always the gentlest person in the world. Patience. Bearing with one another. Bearing with one another. Now we can go to 1 Corinthians 13 and go through that list too. We've already done that. Bearing with one another. <clears throat> because let's face it, right? Uh, everybody around us is just really tough to bear with sometimes, right? We all get rubbed the wrong way by everybody. Forgiving one another. That's a big one, right? Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. I taught on forgiveness a number of weeks ago from Matthew, the parable that Jesus gave about forgiveness. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Then it goes on, you know, let, let the word of, <clears throat> or let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. There should be a lot of gratitude within the Christian community. Lots of gratitude. And the, when we do extend forgiveness to each other, mercy to each other, it should never be grudgingly because we're so grateful that we were forgiven. The, the amount of gratitude we should have should be profound. Tomorrow's Thanksgiving. And we have so much to be grateful for, not just because of what this, the things that this country has afforded us, but ultimately, and far more importantly, what God has given us, right? Now, <clears throat> I got a couple minutes. Let's, uh, let's look at some, uh, you know, the Jesus style is even in the Old Testament, right? Let's look at, uh, let's go to the book of Proverbs and just look at a couple of, couple of Proverbs. Some very specific directives on how we can show the Jesus style, how we can live the Jesus style. And then we'll close up. Maybe I'll get a little feedback from you guys or if there's any questions. I wanted to point out, and I, read, I was reading in my devotional time uh, a few days ago, maybe a week ago, and I ran across this verse and I thought, that, that's a good one for what we're talking about on Wednesdays. Look at verse one. Proverbs 15. Did I say 15? If I didn't, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, verse one. Now, do you see what that says? Somebody read that out loud to me. 
Hold on, one at a time. Uh, go ahead, Colette, go ahead. Good and loud. Okay, the rest of it. Read that again. Well, there's a Jesus-style response right there, the first part of the verse. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. You know that old saying about inserting our foot into our mouths? There's another verse that says, you know, in the multitude of words, sin is very near, but he that refrains his lips is wise. Loose lips do sink big ships. Remember that one? <clears throat> Boy, that tongue, man. That tongue needs to be tamed. That's a tough thing to tame, according to James, right? James says, man, that, holding that tongue, world of iniquity, like a flames of fire can come out of that mouth. But a gentle answer turns away wrath. Uh, how about Jesus on the cross, what I just mentioned, right? Turns away wrath. Remember, remember they're cursing at him. Oh, if you're the son of God, come down. They're just mocking. But a gentle answer from our Lord. Amazing. But harsh words stir up anger. One of the thieves had some harsh words for Jesus. Remember that? Jesus offered forgiveness to the other thief. Look, uh, go to the left to Proverbs 10. Let's see. I'm looking for a volunteer. Up, oh, John, John Davis just raised his hand. Thank you, John. I saw your finger go up in your lap. <coughs> John, <laughs> read verse 12. Good and loud. Now that's a good one there. And uh, that's actually quoted in uh, 1 Peter as well. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers transgressions. Now, when I think about love covering transgressions, here's what I think of. Noah's sons. Ham, look at that. He's drunk and naked. What did the, uh, what does Shem and Japheth do? They don't even look at their father. They walk in backwards and they cover his nakedness. Everybody knows he's drunk. But do we need to run around and advertise it? No. We see he's drunk. Let's, and we're not glossing it over. We're not trying to veil the reality of the problem. But you see, the nature of the Lord is to cleanse sin. Sin has to be dealt with. There's no question about that. But love has a way of not wanting to make another person pay for what they've done. We love that in the media today. That's why we have newspapers. I mean, newspapers is all about exploitation of transgression. Don't we love it? We love it when a person falls. We love seeing the, the tabloids, the, I mean, paparazzi. They love to see a fallen individual. They get paid good money to take a picture of some guy who snuck into a hotel room with a prostitute. And we eat up that stuff. And we talk about, oh, yeah, can you believe they did that? Oh, man, that was bad. Boy, that was bad. Figures, liberals, you know. <laughs> but see it's actually hatred that likes to stir the pot but love doesn't seek to do that love does seek a remedy for sin there's no question about that the sin problem has to be dealt with but then it doesn't need to be carried on after that uh, look at uh, 17 chapter 17 Yes, Katie, you can read verse 17, chapter 17, verse 9. Go ahead. Good and loud. 
Chapter Proverbs 17, verse 9. Just read it good and loud. There you go. He who conceals a transgression seeks love. He who repeats a matter separates intimate friends. See, that, that actually ties in with what we, the verse we just read in chapter, chapter 10, right? And this is what, this has, this obviously you would tie this in with things like forgiveness, right? Sometimes we uh, don't want to forget a transgression that has been committed against us. And sometimes that, the very fact that we won't let it go can cause breach in relationships, right? I mean, I've seen so many Christian couples that have divorced in recent years. Not because there was adultery, not because there, were, there was some legitimate reason, but because they just couldn't get along. They, they couldn't reconcile. They couldn't come to terms with something. They were at an impasse. The disagreement was just so sharp. And when there was a very short-lived forgiveness, they couldn't stop bringing it up, and they parted ways. Very sad. You know, James chapter 4, I'll just read this to you real quick, and then we'll close. Uh, James chapter 4, verse 1. You guys know this one. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? I was going to take us to Matthew 20 when, we the, when the disciples were fighting over who... It, remember when uh, James and John asked if they could sit at the right and left hand of Jesus on his throne? And uh, Jesus said, well, you know, that's not for me to give, that's for the Father. And then the other disciples heard the, the position you know, what James and John were vying for, trying to get from the Lord, and they got all indignant about the fact that they wanted that place. They were fighting over who was going to be greatest in the kingdom. I mean, obviously, these disciples who were with Jesus every day really missed so much of what Jesus was trying to live out in front of them. And quarreling and bickering over the who is going to get the upper hand? And that's what a lot of these rights movements in our culture are all about. Feminism, that's what it's all about. The type of feminism that we, that's promoted in our culture, that has been promoted in our culture for decades, is about ascendancy. It's about who's going to get to call the shots. I know we like to think that it's equality, but it transcends the barriers of equality goes beyond that. The LGBT community doesn't just, just want equality. They want to dictate what the terms are. They want to call the shots. And so the Lord calls us to humility, servanthood, and, and accepting what our place is. That's a big thing, right? Accepting the role that God has us in. Let's hear some comments or questions. In fact, <clears throat> at the very end of the, uh, of, the, of the book and the study guide, there's a little series of uh, questions here. <laughs> One of the questions is, how do you feel about yourself now in relation to the list of traits the traits of Jesus, does it seem overpowering? <clears throat> what do you guys think about that? Any thoughts on that? I mean, go ahead. It's not overpowering. In fact, it's, it's sitting here just thinking about it and having taught it and gone through it for myself. If we're honest with ourselves, we already know what Jesus thought. Mm -hmm. We already, already know it. It's what goes back to what you were saying Do, I, I need to do, I don't do. We, we already know. 
that's one of the reasons I wanted to go to the Proverbs 15.1, just to show one example of how the soft word turns away wrath, grievous words stir up anger. You know, it's, it's always about our response to things, right? How we're going to respond. And when we respond biblically, we're, this is why I said demystify, right? When we respond biblically, then we're walking in the spirit. It's, it's not really rocket science or it's, it's not real deep necessarily. It's something that every Christian can do. I, I know that there's the issue of sometimes we don't want to do it. I'd like to know, is there anybody w- that would like to just, what, what's, what's the hardest part of this for you personally? Does anybody want to share, like, what is the thing that you find most challenging <clears throat> about the Jesus style? I think for me, I'll, I'll tell you what one of the biggest things for me is. I think sometimes I can get on my high horse very easily, most especially when I feel like I'm right. You ever feel like, and I have a harder time letting go. I have a harder time maybe extending forgiveness to someone if I feel like they haven't met what I feel is, is a legitimate, like I want them to pay a little bit. I, I want them to grovel a little bit. I want them to, to feel as badly about what I think they've done to me as I feel like, as I feel like they've done. I want, I want it to be a kind of an equal thing. Has anybody else ever? Any comments on that? Ricky, I saw you nod your head. Now, here's another thing. I think that it's quite possible, even probable, that sometimes Christians genuinely don't know. And one of the reasons they don't know is they don't read read the Bible enough to understand what's expected. I think that's pretty realistic, right? Um, I've heard especially during this election cycle that we just went through, we've heard a lot about things like hate, uh, racism. Does our culture, the non-Christian culture, do they know what hate is? I don't even think they know or what love is. They don't know what love is. They have a, they have Love for them is, and hate for them, this whole love-hate thing for them, it's whatever they decide in their minds is something that's worthy of love or something that's worthy of hate. It's what they decide inside their own hearts and minds. But what we've been learning in the Jesus style is, no, it's what God, we, we come to this on God's terms and he tells us this is what good is and this is what bad is. As human beings, we don't decide that. God decides that. We have a basis for which we can determine what's good and what's bad. You young people, you all are growing up in a culture. You guys need to make sure you're putting your minds, you're focusing your attention on the word of God so much because it's just chaos with the young people. The young people don't know, don't have a clue by and large on what morality even is. I mean, the, the generation since 1974 has grown up thinking that it's okay to murder a baby in the womb as long as it's your civil right. 
as long as it's your legal right that that's okay. I mean, you grow up with that year after year after year after year, and it becomes ingrained in the culture. Suddenly, the, the worldview, the whole perspective of the culture is moving in one direction, and you're sitting there as a Christian going, whoa, man, I am really swimming against the tide. And we are. We always are. All right. Any other thoughts, comments before we close? Yes. That's very good. Very good point. Sometimes it's not in my heart to want to forgive. And I pray, Lord, help me forgive. Give me, the, that's a very good point. Give me the ability to forgive. I mean, let's face it, sometimes bitterness, the veins of bitterness run deep. And sometimes we just don't want to let it go. And so thank you for sharing that. That's exactly right. Anybody else? Right. Exactly. Amen. Paul is kind of laid in the Romans here. Exactly. Exactly. Anyone else before we wind things down? Okay. Reggie, why don't you close us out? Father God, thank you, Lord, for your word, Lord. Thank you, yes. Lord, that you continue to teach us. You've given us everything that we need, Lord, to live in Jesus' style. You've made it possible, Lord. This is not something that's outside of our, our ability, Lord. It's there. We have it. We know it. It's just putting it into practice. So, Lord, that's our prayer tonight, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, live with Jesus now, to, to be the men and women you've called us to be, in the way you've called us to be. Father, we ask your blessing. We thank you for this night. We thank you for your word. We ask you to help us continue to grow in wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, you guys have a blessed Thanksgiving. Have a wonderful day tomorrow. God bless you guys. Amen. <laughs>